back, everyone, to the Research VR podcast, the podcast behind the science and design of virtual reality. I am your host, Oz Balabanyan, and with me today is special guest, uh, the project manager at NOAA Labs, Noah Zirkin. Hello, Noah. Hey, how's it going, Oz? Great. And, of course, we have beaming in from Germany, Mr. Peter Lekoff. Well, good morning, everyone. Yes, it's a good morning indeed. We are actually doing, uh, for the first time, uh, also a video podcast at the same time because uh, our guest is going to be doing a little show and tell <laughs> on oh, this webcam of some of the hardware and the gear that he's been playing with, including the project, um, the the Leap Motion Project North Star, which we've talked about on this podcast many a times. Uh, it's an open source AR headset that has had us um, inkling and tingling at our fingertips <laughs> to getting our hands in AR. Um, oh, yes. And all the other, there's actually a few other AR headsets that you, Noah, are um, quite familiar with. So we're going to use this opportunity to have you on the podcast to talk about what it takes to build a Project North Star, um, how it works, how it feels, and what you've been doing with it. Okay. Yeah. So let's let's start kind of at the beginning. How did you find yourself in this realm of virtual reality and augmented reality, and how you're working here? Okay. It's a it's kind of a long story. I'll try to abridge it. Um, I, I suppose I first heard the term augmented reality while on a summer camp field trip to the MIT Media Lab. Nice. And, uh, and I was uh, fourteen. And Steve Mann and Thad Starner were there at the time. And we actually got to have a, uh, a little uh, Q&A session with uh, Thad Starner, um, who, if you guys don't know, uh, ended up on the Google Glass team and has been ah. a, a real uh, research luminary in, in wearable computers for, for a really long time. So. Um, I think he mentioned AR. What it's certainly the first. Uh, this would have been ninety four. Oh, okay. Yeah, we're going way back. Yep, I think they had just gotten their hands on a Virtual Boy, which Ooh. we got to try out. Yeah, it sounds yeah. about right. Yeah. So, yep. Um, he uh, he was rocking a uh, Twiddler two uh, cording keyboard. It might it might have even been Twiddler one at the time. What kind of keyboard um, was it? A, a, uh, it's basically a pistol grip cording keyboard. So you ah, input the one from letters. Nintendo. Uh, no, no, uh, I forget the company behind it, but there are um, three columns of four buttons, I believe, and the and the characters are different combinations of those buttons. And so it goes into a little holster, and uh, I think the more recent ones have a little trackball on top. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, he he was wearing a little computer in a fanny pack and had a um, had a little monochrome headset hot glued to uh, some safety glasses. He'd cut a hole in these safety glasses <laughs> and, and put a little display on there. Uh, would have been one of the, the first sort of micro displays, I guess, something akin to the viewfinder on a uh, on an old camcorder. Mm -hmm. And um, <clears throat> and then he had this pistol grip keyboard, and I was just like, wow, this is the coolest thing, mm. you know, ever. And I was sort of into uh, sci-fi concepts like uh, you know, heads-up displays, power armor, Sure. stuff like that you know so so as a 14 year old into this kind of thing i was just like wow this this stuff actually exists there's people there are people working on it and in the case of ar there's a journey to describe it um and then let's see years years later so so i then you know had a, a sort of uh um, i ended up working in, uh, well, I had a few odd jobs, uh, in, including for uh, TechServe, which is a, was a computer retailer in New York. It was the, the first Mac store mm -hmm. uh, maybe in the country and is 
the store was the store that Apple based the whole Genius Bar model on. Hmm. Um, but uh, after, let's see, after leaving there, I got introduced to the Arduino hmm. by... Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, so I really started out with hardware. Um, and I... And were you into, like, early you know, HMDs as well, like DK1, DK2, um, from a hardware perspective? Well, yeah, actually, so, so the first arguably VR headset that I had was a Fusix VR 920. Sure. Um, the tracking on it was pretty awful um, <laughs> because I think it was entirely magnetometer-based. There was an accelerometer uh... and a magnetometer in it, no gyro. So, um, you know, it... It was a pretty low Must have been awful. Uh, update rate. Yeah, it was awful. Um, but was but it augmented like reality or VR? VR. So it was VR. So it was VR, um, and it was basically video glasses with a a partial IMU in there. So um, just the accelerometer and magnetometer, and of course for a high refresh rate on a high update rate on an IMU, you really need the gyro there. Um, so. Um, uh, and actually, they ended up, uh, I, I basically electrical taped a webcam to uh, the top of that to do pass-through AR mm. and was running it from a, a laptop in my backpack. And, uh, and then Paul Travers, the, uh, the CEO of Fusix, uh, ended up releasing, uh, they ended up releasing a webcam specifically to go onto the front of, of that device. Uh, for for doing pass through uh, AR, and I think I think I have serial number one of <laughs> uh, uh, of that camera at what, least. What sort of what sort of latency did um, did a system like that have for the pass through AR? Um, well, it was pretty brutal. I mean, of course, it depended on the uh, on the computer itself. It was a it was I think it was better than VGA the camera, but. Um, you know, uh, you know, maybe 1024 by 768, and uh, it like was latency. I, in, yeah, in, in terms of latency, because um, that's the killer. I honest, <laughs> yeah, I I honestly don't recall it for the pass through itself. So so this uh, the CV stuff that I that I was running on it was uh, pretty awful because I was doing it in processing, so it was all Java based. Um, and uh, using a library called Myron, Myron CV, I think, and uh, J Myron, it was called. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so that introduced a fair bit of latency, but um, the latency on the video itself wasn't so bad that it compromised my ability to use it. So I actually went out into public wearing this thing. I rode the New York City subway with it uh, a couple of times, really um, freaked people out. Um, yeah. and Do you by any chance know the anime code Serious Experiment Lane? Because yeah. particularly in the beginning, when you today, this, uh, uh, in the beginning of the show, describes the situation where he had like this pocket computer, like what you're describing is one on one the scene where the guy literally uploaded his consciousness into the IP protocol, sticks some computers to his body, basically walks like a cyber and creeps the hell out of people. Must have been really fearful for those people, right? Oh, Alexa. <laughs> Alexa. <laughs> oh, German. I love the German Alexa. Yeah, sorry. Uh, it wasn't Alexa. Uh, so, so were people were like freaked out by it, or? Uh, I got a lot of strange looks. I mean, th there's always weird stuff going on on the New York City subway. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> actually, I've got a, a weird encounter to uh, tell you about from the New York City subway as well. Um, <laughs> Uh, but the, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't think most of the people on the train had ever seen anything like that before. And, um, yeah, it was, it, it was pretty odd, but it was fun. I, I, do you think I sort today, of like freaking people out. Do you think today they would react differently or? Uh, yeah, probably. Um, okay. I didn't get anybody speaking to me or asking me, uh, questions. I think nowadays they would. At this point, everybody's mm. familiar with VR headsets. If they haven't tried them, at least they've seen them. And mm. uh, so I think people would engage with me. Um, 
but uh, at the time, people were just looking at me like an alien. Right. Okay. So let's get let's get into kind of like the the more recent developments. Um, I'm guessing you you know kept kept yourself familiar with with for your headsets that were coming out, perhaps even a Hollow yeah. Ones and a Magic Leap. Um, but what what drew you to uh, actually, I don't know if you, if are you the first? You might not be the first that built a North Star, or how many people in the world have built um, this open okay. source project North Star? And yeah, okay. give us the, the maybe a broader context if I don't if I don't know it already. So as far as I know, the first project North Star built outside of Leap Motion uh, was built by a team at a company called Exe in Japan. And there is actually a pretty big uh, Japanese enthusiast community uh, around North Star at this point. Mm -hmm. They recently had a meetup, and I think they had 10 different units there um, oh. that people had built, and they were all different variants. Right. Every single right. one of them right. was unique, which was, was very cool to see. And, um, and because it's this open source project, of course, people are going to fork it into all kinds of different things. And so Axis uh, was a fork um, because they ended up using these displays that were originally intended for the Raspberry Pi, um, not the uh, extremely high refresh rate, low latency no. displays <clears throat> that were prescribed by Leap Motion. So, oh, pardon me. So I'm, they must have that's been actually, really basically not suited for this case, right? I mean, usually those uh, Arduino Raspberry Pi screens are like the cheapest one you can get, right? Um, so, so the displays they were using at first, I don't think they were using the SPI driven displays. I think, I think they did have HDMI in. So um, oh, okay. it wasn't so bad, basically a, uh, a smaller variant, I think somewhere around here, I have like a six inch uh, Raspi display. But can you, also um, can you also describe kind of uh, in general how the North Star works? Because uh, I mean, just looking at the, the videos of you wearing it, perhaps some people, uh, including us, like don't fully understand um, how the even the like, I guess, primarily how do optics work? How does the display work? OK, so. The optics path is pretty, pretty simple. Nice. Um, so Noah's now, now let me let me sorry describe. Noah is now showing us the North Star that he has built by himself. If you want to see this, if this is on our YouTube page. So find uh, look up Research VR podcast on YouTube, and you will watch this. Yeah, and if you ever looked at the Magic Leap and have been thinking in only pictures, man, I'm disappointed. I'm looking right now in this project North Star, and I'm like, I want to have it on my head right now. Cyberpunk. AF. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> tell tell us more. Well, it it is Cyberpunk AF. That said, um, I I don't want to badmouth Magic Leap or anything because oh, um, they <laughs> well no because they have a variable focal depth in a way that nobody else uh, does at this point. Maybe you know, to a certain degree, right? Sure. It may not be. It may not be the light field display that we were led to believe they were going to be yeah, releasing. Exactly. Um, and yes, I was disappointed with it. Right. That said, um, that said, they have um, variable focal depth, and nobody else does. That is prob that situation is probably going to change in a few days at, yeah, uh, at MWC. Yes, exactly with Hololens too. Um, oh, I, I yep. Uh, that was that was a funny encounter too. Um, I mentioned to you guys before the uh, podcast, before we started recording, that uh, I was just skiing in uh, Whistler uh, near Vancouver um, a few days ago, and uh, <clears throat> I I was getting a drink in a bar with my father, and I overheard two guys uh, next to me talking about industrial IoT. And, you know, in, in my day job, we do, um, you know, we build industrial IoT projects and I'm actually managing one right now. So I said, hey, what kind of project are you guys working on and so forth? Um, and they said, well, actually we're with Microsoft. And uh, mm -hmm. one of them is like, yeah, I'm on the Azure IoT team. 
And I'm like, cool, I, I might be uh, calling on you. Let's exchange contact info. And my father chimes in and goes, maybe you should tell them about the AR stuff. And one of the guys mm. goes, oh, uh, yeah, I was on the HoloLens team. And mm. uh, so that ended up being an interesting conversation in that, uh, you know, I had some people to ask him, hey, do you know this person or that person? Actually, Microsoft ended up recruiting my roommate from back in New York to be one of the mm. UI designers for uh, HoloLens, which is funny because I think I introduced him to the concept of AR um, uh, good quite, quite, <laughs> quite a long time ago. And then he goes, hey, I got a job with Microsoft. And I'm like, what are you going to be doing? Is uh, I can't tell you. And like three years later, HoloLens drops. And he's like, that's what I was doing. I'm just like, you son of a, you know, <laughs> but. Um, we should, by right the way, we should for sure um, talk about the HoloLens too, at least what we can speculate or what we would like maybe towards the end of the podcast. Um, hopefully this will yep. come out before the uh, the announcement in March. So, yeah. If not, yep. you all can know that we failed miserably with our predictions. Or not. Maybe or we not. did. Yeah, this could be a great time uh, time capsule. Well, so, uh, yes. sorry about the digression. So, um, no, 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 that's, I, I, this, is, this is a podcast, yes. <laughs> okay, cool. I, I could go on about... Uh, I have lots of funny anecdotes like that. And that is... One of one of my least strange random encounters with people in the industry. Um, um, the, pro probably uh, the most notable one was running into Sergey Brin on the New York City subway. And you guys have probably seen the photo that I took uh, of him. Uh, is, maybe not. Is this it was, a famous? It photo? went viral as hell. Okay. Yeah, it's a famous photo. It's uh, it's Brin on the subway wearing glass before it was released. Um, wearing a beanie and has like a plastic, you know, Chinese food bag. And, oh, I uh, see it. Uh, uh, here, it, let me pull it up on the video. Yeah, um, if you just look up Sergey Brin Subway. You'll you'll find that picture. Um, <laughs> All right. Cool. So back um, to back to Leap Motion. Uh, yes. <laughs> so. Um, for the, so the reflectors are, the, it's actually a freeform uh, reflector. And uh, it was, I believe the, the first iteration of the design was done by um, a kid named, a, a guy named uh, Adam. And I'm trying to, I, I don't remember his last name off the top of my head. Um, and he actually ended up um, partnering up with, uh, I, I think David Holtz recruited him uh, to Leap Motion specifically to work on North Star. Oh, nice. And I think he designed, the, yeah, well, um, on all aspects of it, actually. So he also did the, uh, the first iteration, if, if not of the display driver board hardware, at least the firmware. So if you dig through the uh, analogics, uh, library code um, for the display driver firmware. Um, a lot of the files have his name on it. So I mm -hmm. think he did uh, basically all of the initial configuration uh, yeah. of that. So he wasn't just doing the optics design. So um, so the optics are um, have a 50-50 um, uh, reflective coating on, on the inside, uh, the particular lenses that I have. Um, I believe it's it's a, uh, a silver-based uh, coating, um, and then there's a protective coating uh, over that, and then on the outer surface, that secondary surface, you have an anti-reflective coating. Um, the anti-reflective coating on this one isn't perfect, so you do get a little bit of secondary reflection. So that's sort of a, uh, a you know very slight. Uh, ghost image of what you actually want to be there, just slightly behind it. Um, there are more perfect anti-reflective coatings, and um, I'm looking into uh, having them uh, improve the one uh, that's um, uh, one on question. the lenses that we're producing. Yeah. Um, I think I read somewhere on Reddit that there was someone mass producing for the community those lenses. It's you, Red. That that would be me. <laughs> Perfect. That would be me. So, um, yeah. Uh, so, 
when I first first started looking into uh, building the North Star headset, um, you know, the, the whole promise of this project is that it can be built for around a hundred bucks, right? And and that's what's so intriguing about it. You know, when when something like the uh, Magic Leap costs what is it, twenty three, twenty five hundred bucks, yeah, um, and and uh, Hololens costs. 3000 and, and so forth, um, uh, you know, price is a big factor in the accessibility of uh, optical pass-through AR. No, and, and when Leap Motion came along and said, hey, we've got a reference design that you can build for a hundred bucks. Well, that certainly piqued my curiosity, of, of course. Um, I ended up, uh, you know, I was a little skeptical about it, but I was waiting for them to release those open source plans. Mm. Um, now, I originally came to China. I guess we didn't mention this, but I'm based in Shenzhen. Um, so I'm based in Shenzhen, China. And, uh, yeah, we hear lots it. of supercars. Shenzhen biker gang. Just heard... <laughs> I, well, so that's kind of funny. I don't, I don't know if I can mentioned this, uh, two, two wheeled motor vehicles, um, gas powered two wheeled motor vehicles are, they, in, are, they uh, are, ver are verboten. Yes. And yes. Uh, so um, that said, there are some motorcycles on the roads. I've been told that um, the former chief of police here has a biker gang <laughs> that he and his friends drive around on motorcycles, um, which okay. is you know, you can interpret that however you want. You can uh, decide what you want to say electric, about right? China, but um, they're yeah. probably electric. Uh, no, no, they they aren't. Um, I don't know if you mm -hmm. guys have ever watched the like ADV China uh, YouTube series. You know, they they motorcycle around China and uh, sort of give commentary about it while they're doing so uh, over there. Intercoms. Okay. Um, but most of the, um, you know, you can have a motorcycle in China, but not inside the tier one cities. And um, so that said, um, you know, I don't know if I should say this. I do ride around on an electric motorcycle in Shenzhen and it is technically very illegal. And, um, but uh, I are, are seem to be getting away with it somehow. Before we move on, uh, is it you said all two tiered vehicles in Shenzhen are, are two two wheeled two wheeled sorry um, yeah. no so uh, electric bikes are legal but they I think they can't go over twenty five kilometers an hour yeah, so similar can, to Germany you can pedal a normal bicycle faster than that and um, it has to have pedals and it can't weigh more than yeah. some ridiculously small number of kilos the motor has to be under 300 watts i think maybe it's lower than mm, that that's not much my bike has a 1500 watt motor yeah. on it and uh which is still pretty low but it, it's incredibly exactly. well tuned it's it's got a bosch controller and bosch motor mm. on it and it you know gets up to basically all electric bicycles have no bosch motors well a lot of them a lot of them yeah it's pretty um, dominant I, no, not in china not in china um, most mm. of them are domestic, so and okay. an electric bike with a Bosch motor on it here is sort of a luxury item. Um, so anyway, another digression. Where, yeah, you're in the hardware yeah. capital of the world where that's where people go to prototype. That's where they have their prototyping yeah. teams. Um, that's where they can print these very quickly or even the, the raw materials are, are accessible. Is that yeah. kind of where you found yourself to be? Well, so so I originally came to Shenzhen as part of Hacks. Uh, back then, it was called Hackcelerator. So it was the first hardware hardware startup accelerator in the world, um, and I was pretty early on uh, batch three um, of Hacks. So at, uh, actually, in the way I got introduced to it, another anecdote: a uh, friend of mine, Zach Hogan, he was the uh, brains behind MakerBot and uh, used to run the RepRap Research Foundation. He was based out of NYC Resistor, a hackerspace in New York. And um, he had left MakerBot over the fact that they had gone closed source on certain parts of their most recent printer. And um, so uh, 
So he ended up being one of the co-founders of this hardware startup accelerator in Shenzhen. Um, and he, uh, and he was the resident engineer there. So, uh, I was building a wearable input device for controlling heads up displays because I hated that I had to swipe on the side of my head to use Google glass, drove me nuts, drove me so crazy that I decided to go to China and build a remote control for the thing. Um, mm -hmm. and glass. sort of counter, yeah, for Google glass. Oh, cool. Um, so, um, so. I ran off to China to do that. I, I had I had a wearable input device that I, I, I had been building for uh, for years before. It was actually sort of the descendant of a data glove that uh, I built I, uh, quite a long time ago, maybe ten years ago, and that was sort of hyped by uh, Ori Inbar, who ended up going on to found uh, uh, AWE, uh, right. previously mm. known as ARI. So, so he and I go way back. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, but anyway, uh, I, I had this wearable uh, input device that was uh, IMU based um, and <clears throat> uh, it was sort of a partial data glove. So um, I came here to commercialize that and then ended up uh, doing something slightly instead, uh, slightly different instead which is a combination trackpad, air mouse, uh, I'll show you guys hmm. that on, on the video in a, in a little bit. But um, so, so I came to China to build that, a wearable input device for controlling heads up displays. And so years later, I, I ended up sort of getting stuck here for, for different reasons and um, uh, ended up working for this uh, company, Noah Labs, um, which is not my company. It, <laughs> How is it not? Just, I... <laughs> I, it is so weird, you know, um, maybe it had something to do with why I applied for the job, um, hmm. but uh, um, yeah. So, so I guess I've sort of become a mascot of the company, but um, yeah, but it had the name before I worked here. So, hmm. um, so I ended up working uh, for this product development company, Noah Labs. Um, so, you know, I've got a team of electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, and, and uh, firmware engineers at my disposal. Um, and I sort of dabble in all of those, but they're, you know, uh, they're better at all of those things than I am. Um, so Leap Motion uh, releases you know, rather announces this reference design and puts out these really intriguing videos. Um, I then, uh, maybe a month later, month and a half later, uh, I was in town uh, in San Francisco for Maker Faire and AWE. And uh, they were having an event at the local PAX office in San Francisco. And I pop in for that and I run into uh, Cyril Ebis Wheeler. Um, who is uh, who was one of the founders of Hacks, and um, also happens to be one of the first investors in Leap Motion. Mm -hmm. So um, now it had been a few months later. Leap Motion had already said, "Hey, we're about to release this reference design," and then didn't. And um, mm -hmm. I was so I went over and pulled Cyril aside, and I said, "Hey, could." Could you talk to your friends over at Leap? I'm really psyched for this design, um, but where is it? Are they actually going to open source it? Um, and he said, "Well, it's still the plan. We'll see." Um, I said, "Well, how is it? You know, I heard that uh, you know uh, Magic Leap One hadn't dropped yet, but I've been told by somebody that hey, it's actually just going to use layered waveguides, not some uh, more exotic light field system, um, and uh, and." So I mentioned that to uh, Cyril and I'm like, so, you know, can this thing begin to compare? And he goes, this is so much better. I've tried it <laughs> and it's so much better. Just be patient. It's coming. And, um, and sure enough, it did. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I'm looking at this reference design and uh, yes, all of the components are cheap in mass production, but if you want to get these lenses made, um, you have to have them uh, 
probably the, the most straightforward way to do it and the way that we motion did it was to have it diamond turned so milled with a diamond tip out of a block of acrylic pmma uh, okay. plastic and it sounds uh, expensive it is expensive uh several hundred bucks uh at least um <clears throat> unless you happen to have a diamond turning machine on hand and oh, most people don't. Um, yep. And, uh, and then you had to get coding stuff and that isn't cheap either, especially if you're doing a one-off. So, you know, I, I don't know if you uh, know how optical coatings like this work, but uh, these are done in either a sputtering machine or an e-beam machine and these are these are really cool these are uh vacuum chambers and yeah. in the case of a sputtering uh machine you have and it's a really intense vacuum and and uh in the case of a uh, sputtering machine you have a uh basically a block a chunk of the material that you want to deposit uh onto your lenses or, or surface and um uh, and this is basically um the case with any mirrored lens uh, that you see. So, um, so this is pretty cool to think of when, when you see these lenses. Um, it what isn't just mirrors? painted on or sprayed on. Um, I mean, even sunglasses. Lenses? Okay. Okay. Right. Just to get an idea. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so it isn't actually that exotic a process, but it's not that well known by lay people. I think, um, I wasn't familiar with it. Um, so, uh, so they, then shoot, so, so you have your, your lens facing this block of material that you want deposited onto it. And then they shoot an electron gun at, the, at this block of material and it causes um, you know, a, a atomic or molecular scale bits of this material to come flying off in the opposite direction and stick to the object that you want coded. Hmm. Um, so, and, and then with uh, with an E beam, they're actually so that's an electron beam. They're vaporizing hmm. the material uh, that they want, and then it sort of uniformly coats everything in the chamber. Whereas with sputtering, it's it's this directional thing. Um, so uh, again, getting samples of this done um, is. Uh, you know, not so easy to do and pretty expensive uh, if you're doing it at a, at a small scale and you aren't at a research institution that might actually have this equipment in their labs. Um, so just just to clarify, Noah, uh, what are the basic components of, of the um, of the headset? So what would you, what, what do you okay. like at a very high level need? It sounds like uh, this okay. kind of this display unit uh, or sorry. Yep. The, the, yeah. So so you have these. So you have these reflectors, these lenses that are 50-50, have this 50-50 reflective coating on the uh, inside of the lens. Um, and then you have uh, displays, right? Um, which in the case of the reference design uh, were actually made for VR. So they are uh, 1600 by 1440 each, right? So the uh, combined resolution is seen by the computer you've got this hooked up to is uh, 2880 um, by 1600. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, pretty high res. And um, and these particular displays are uh, also 120 hertz uh, refresh rate yeah. um, and very low persistence. What kind uh, of very panel low is it? So it's made by a company called BOE and it's, it's an LCD, it's not OLED. Okay. So it's a, a very low persistence LCD. Um, and, uh, I don't remember the, uh, the acronym for it, uh, off the top of my head, but there's, um, you know, it's a form of TFT. Cool. Um, That's probably the stuff they put in those, uh, pretty new recent gamer, uh, monitors where they drive the graphics driver or, or like, like the, the driver unit for the screen very high to those high refresh yep. rates. Mm. Interesting. I think these are. I think these are also going into some of the demo, uh, WMR headsets, the no, Windows Mixed Reality headsets. Oh, interesting. Um, yep. Yeah, so, also, yeah. yep. Um, so, uh, again, uh, these aren't terribly expensive uh, at, at scale, but you can't even buy them as an individual. And uh, as 
as an individual in the West, BOE won't even talk to you. No. Um, okay. uh, so, you know, that they, they're dealing with OEMs, mm. right? Uh, large, large scale manufacturers. Um, so you have an impossible to sort, uh, impossible to source display and a very hard to make, uh, although not that exotic reflector. Right. And it so, explains a lot why it's not that wide spread, right? Yet. <laughs> yes. Mm. Why it's not widespread yet. And then you have a display driver PCB. Now mm. there are a bunch of off the shelf display driver boards that you can get and people are using them for other variants of the North Star. Um, none of them are capable of driving this display. Yeah, it's a pretty high resolution plus frame rate. Yeah. Yep. Wasn't there recently a company announcing like new display drivers that would handle, I don't know, like 8K, 120 frames or whatever for those VR headsets? So there is something um, happening, but again, how do you source it, right? You only can get it in a big right. bulk. Yeah, I mean, so people have actually been doing uh, North Star variants um, based on torn down WMR headsets. Hmm. So people are taking apart Windows uh, Mixed Reality headsets and using the parts to build North Stars. Um, which is kind of cool because it also has the inside out six off tracking. Right? Yeah, true. Um, so they're adapting it to, uh, for use with that as well. Ooh. I know one guy, actually, the uh, admin of the uh, North Star Discord server, um, has just recently completed uh, one of those. Um, but uh, Leap Motion designed their own board uh, based on an. Analogix 7530, I think, driver chip. And Analogix is probably also the company making that 8K display driver I see. Okay, um, I'm not sure, but right. uh, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Um, but you can't and, print it yourself, right? You need to source it somewhere, or does it need well, to be printed? Uh, so the PCB, the display driver yeah. PCB, um, well, it's, uh, it has some pretty tough requirements, tolerances. It's got uh, one millimeter vias. So that's drilled, coated uh, holes, plated holes that mm -hmm. are uh, one millimeter across. And that um, most PCB houses in the US and even uh, most of the easily accessible PCB manufacturers here uh, can't do that. Their equipment uh, it just doesn't support it. Mm. Um, and um, so, uh, again, it isn't uh, it isn't just a matter of you know, ordering it and then and then assembling it. It's also hard to get the analogics chips, um, and uh, so so is the easiest you know this hundred dollar <laughs> is the easiest yeah and, and that's <laughs> then well so the frame is three D printable right in and. Um, so nobody's mass producing the frames, as far as I know. So yeah, but you could go over. to an online, uh, you know, 3D print uh, service yeah, of your choice. Whatever, yeah, you yeah. could just go to Shapeways if, if you're in the States. Uh, I think they might be global at this point. And then there are lots of them here in China. Mm, um, why do you think uh, Leap Motion doesn't actually provide a store with, you know, DIY kits? Because, um, I mean, it's very nice of them to release it. And uh, it's no mean of critics, but it's like, is it some kind of natural filter they built in so non-tech people can't build it? No, man. And... <laughs> I know they were focused on other things. I mean, so what I what I've heard, my impression is that they're real perfectionists over there. Oh, they are. Right? Yeah, and, I heard it from other they, point, Yeah, and that they were even hesitant to release the reference design as it was. Um, so they may have been considering making kits, but uh, I think the idea was ultimately that companies would take this reference design and um, yeah. uh, and make derivative commercial products from it, right? Mm -hmm. That it wasn't going to be this hobbyist thing. No, that um, makes definitely sense. What kind of tracking does your headset has right now? OK, well, I'll get to that in, because that's in also one kind second. Of um, well, yeah. Um, the, uh, so I'm actually uh, about to start selling kits, and I oh, think cool. part of the reason why they didn't um, jump straight into doing the kits was because I told them I was going to. Um, the um, the uh, so the reflectors uh, were you know hard to hard to make and hard to get, 
And this, this hundred dollar reference design ended up, you know, it was going to end up costing 800 bucks to, uh, to build mm -hmm. and, you know, something like that. Um, and, uh, so I said, you know, screw this. What's what's the point of that if uh, if people are going to have to pay so much for it? Um, you know, I could, you know, I end up calling up uh, Edmund Optical and asking uh, asking how much it was going to cost to uh, get these reflectors made. And I said, you know what? I'm in Shenzhen. Um, uh, I'm just going to have an injection mold made. And so I searched around for a company that would do it uh, inexpensively enough that I could mm. afford it, um, and that was confident in their ability to do an optical grade mold. And uh, took them uh, about a month to do, and uh, and so I had blank reflector samples out of that, um, you know, pretty pretty quickly. But uh, you're probably in the only place. But you're literally in the only place on earth probably where you could pull it off, right? I mean, Shenzhen is literally like the hub for innovation. Yep. I mean, like one third of those Kickstarter projects that actually are quite interesting and succeed come from Shenzhen. I mean, it's, it's, it's a gut feeling. I don't know. It's 30%, it's, 90%, uh, who knows? But like, I mean, there are so many to come in. To, to come in They're probably all manufactured here. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No doubt. Yeah. Right. Um, so Noah, I mean, uh, actually going back to Peter, what you were saying, why doesn't Leap sell kits? If I mean, if they wanted to sell this headset, they wouldn't sell kits. They would sell an actual thing. Or what they were trying to do with, you know, Dragonfly and their mobile sensor yeah. unit is that they were trying to partner with and license with OEMs to actually build it out. Um, exactly. I think with, for that, I mean, to do that, you need a significant amount of capital, uh, which it sounds like that's kind of was the big like that's like the limiting reagent right it's it's uh if they were able to ha if they had those billions of dollars to build it out and actually to to have a whole supply chain of uh secure to build these things they would have done it but it's very expensive to do it and and if you can if they can't afford to do it then why not you know op open open source it and see what hack what hackers can do um but that's no that's, it's, that's it's definitely a great attitude yeah yeah, no. Um, so, I, I, we didn't realize that you were also thinking about um, mass, not mass producing, but at least perhaps selling kits. All the parts necessary. Yep. Yeah. Um, and uh, so that's actually in the works. It actually got displayed by, Ch uh, sorry, delayed by Chinese New Year, which um, just uh, was uh, just just wrapped up. Right. But um, as far as I know, this is the only headset outside of Leap Motion that has the uh, originally prescribed uh, displays, right? The this is the only one to Leap Motion spec. Wow! Right? Dude, so so cool. it has <laughs> it has the BOE displays in it, and it has the Leap Motion designed display driver board in it. Um, and I've got a hundred of those boards in production right now. Nice. Um, and uh, so that's enough for a hundred kits. Um, the uh, I'm about to do another production run of the lenses, hopefully with improved uh, coatings, and I'll bundle them all together and you know sell it for two hundred something bucks. Sure. Right that that's that's awesome. Um, and obviously we we want to know about it when you do start selling these or put put up a link. We'll I'm sure we'll share it. Tomorrow. It'll be it'll be long before um, this podcast actually gets published. Oh great, um, even better. So. Um, the, the links for ordering the lenses and the displays are already up. So I've got a supply of the displays. Uh, the lenses are already shipping out to people. So um, so I sent off a whole bunch of sets uh, for that North Star uh, meetup in Japan to for them to give out free to students. And then nice. um, oh. and then a bunch of people have also bought them. How, so the these developers in Japan that uh, you said 10 to 11 of them, I'm seeing the, I'm looking at the picture right here um of their headsets are you said you're the only one that's using the 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 prescribed like display unit how else have these developers or these hackers have been making their headsets um how do they work so they're they're sourcing other displays the first iteration of mine used uh displays from sharp uh also made for uh vr headsets um and there are easily sourceable uh driver boards hmm. for that um, but that doesn't uh, fill the entire field of view of, uh, of the reflectors. So, um, and one of the big selling points, as it were, um, of 
of this headset is the field of view, which mm -hmm. just blows everything else mm -hmm. out of the water. So One question, did, um, like, like regards like the field of view and stuff, um, maybe you tried the Meta 2. Could you compare like maybe the HoloLens, the Meta 2, uh, to what you see visually regards the field of view, the sharpness and everything else? Because I think yep. it's just hard to imagine it. So horizontal field of view is uh, pretty comparable. I think it's actually slightly narrower than Meta's, but the vertical field of view, mm. which is something that people don't talk about, um, is tremendous. And um, and there's a, a graphic and illustration that I can send to you guys later. And it is um, uh, it makes such a dramatic difference all of these AR platforms, right? You are basically looking at a letterbox window. Yep. And uh, which doesn't really make sense for real world hand-based interactions. So with this headset, you can reach up and grab something. You can interact with something on your desk without pointing your head down. You can glance mm. down and move your hands around. You can grab something on your desk and put it up on a shelf above your desk without moving your head, just swiveling your eyes. Mm -hmm. And that is so dramatically different from every other AR headset that I've tried. I'm going to see if I can find uh, some interesting videos from your Twitter page, actually. You've been posting um, some great clips of you using this headset, which is kind of how I got it, um, introduced to you. It's just you've been putting some really cool videos on Twitter. Um, so the vertical field of view is it is something that is rarely talked talked about. Uh, and in fact, the first time I realized that its its importance was when I tried the Star VR One headset, which has a extra wide field of view, both horizontally and vertically. And I was like, oh, like I can see my hands, and I were like, I can see my uh -huh. feet, <laughs> or like what where I'm about, I'm about to walk to, and I can see the sky. I mean, in a VR sense, it's slightly different than. Um, than perhaps sitting on a desk, but tell us a little bit about the experience of of um, of how this headset works. I mean, to the layman, or not to the layman, but to uh, someone that knows nothing about AR, you know, they're going to be, you know, they're thinking like, why would I care about this hacking unit versus a fully all in one either Hololens or or Magic Leap? Uh, and 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 I with you know, I can understand where they're coming from, but I think the main thing about why we care about this hacking unit is because the fidelity of the inter interactions that you can have are is just on another level right um yeah. does, it, does it feel that way yeah well i mean the the centerpiece of the interaction right to begin with is the you know is the leap motion controller itself right which as far as i know is still the gold standard for hand, hand tracking right. and uh actually Another anecdote, I was the first person to put a leap motion on a VR headset, actually. If nice. you, if you really? go on Thingiverse and look up, yeah, if you look up Oculus Rift um, uh, leap motion and go back to the oldest entry, I, I made a little 3D printable mount so that hmm. you can stick a, a leap motion on, on a DK1. And uh, oh, yeah. as far as I know, I was the, I was the first person to do that. Um, and, yeah, back uh, then they didn't have a VR focus. They started actually, you know, um, way yeah. before the VR hype basically came in. So they had like those laptop integrations and stuff. Uh, yep. Interesting. Yep. And uh, so, so, of course, that, that's a great thing to be able to build on. Right. Um, and then uh, so, so for hand based interactions, it's it's just fantastic. Um, and then uh, which is why it's so critical that it has this this wide field of view. Um, you're not using a 3D OF uh, pointer or, or even a 60 OF, uh, you know, tracked controller. Right. Um, you want to be able to use this thing. Um, you know, anywhere, uh, anywhere you can see your hands, and um, the, uh, which is something that that I care a lot about. Um, obviously, otherwise I, I wouldn't have stuck, gone to the trouble of sticking one on on a rift way back in the day, and um, and that uh, first data glove that I uh, built, you know, 10, 11 years ago, was because I had this fantasy about, okay, I'm going to have a, a VR or AR headset, and um, I, I hate to do the whole first-person shooter trope, 
but I was like, okay, you know, that's really cool. I can, you know, dual wield and everything, but um, I want to be able to pull a John Woo and stick my hands out in opposite directions, you know, look at one hand, turn to the other and pull the triggers simultaneously. And mm. unless, you know, you're not going to be able to do this outside um, in, uh, you know, uh, you know, in a gaming scenario, unless unless you have a mocap system of some sort, because a sensor mounted on the front of your headset's not going to see it, and obviously, this headset still isn't going to see that, right? But um, but the point is the the uh, the range in which you can track your hands um, really matters a lot, um, and so. Uh, I mean, so so it's a really good place to start with this with this headset. Mm. You know, we want a field of view that's going to be able to display um, a good portion of the range of what the Leap Motion controller uh, mm. can capture. And actually, the Leap Motion controller has a wider wider field of view than the displays. So mm. anywhere within that visible area, your hand is tracked. Right. Um, and I, and I, this is still the original like 2010 or 2012 release leap motion hardware unit, I believe, right? That's, yeah, that's it's just been, crazy. Yeah, it's been the same. I, they might have, I don't know if they've had minor refreshes, but it's ex almost all exactly the same. And they just update yep. the software and their hand tracking even throughout the, you know, three years that this podcast has been out. Uh, we've seen it grow from, um, yeah. I forget what it was first called to the Orion, Orion, uh, update to what it yep. is today um but yeah they they are by far the at the top of you know hand tracking still nobody has been able to catch yep. up to them maybe they're which is behind but yes um, which is crazy and the um in in a really good way and the um yeah the the unit that i have in my north star is the one that i pre-ordered like six years ago Mm -hmm. Nice. I actually got mine for free the first time I applied for like a developer yeah. program of like sending out a lot of them. It's really interesting. Yeah, I felt like a real sucker it. for for pre-ordering with them when they started giving them out for free before I got mine. So my developer friends who uh, you know who applied for it, I was like, you know what? I I paid for it. I bought two. You know, there's no way my friends who applied for this free program are going to get it first. <laughs> and then I ended up you know getting mine months later. Um, uh, yeah but uh yeah so how does the tracking work of the headset yeah, yeah. That's, that's the main variable it seems like that they haven't really thought through and from their videos it, were they using like a vicon or opti -track things they use opti tracks well they they might have been i uh i think they may have just uh stuck a um a vibe tracker on there Okay. No, no. Uh, in the videos no. that they have, they use uh, optical systems. They have like those okay. ping balls okay. attached to the headset. The ping pong paddles um, having okay. you know, yeah. retroreflective kind of dots. But... Because it's very easy yeah. to implement. Um, I think it was. Yeah. Amazing. I mean, if you have any, something you want to make trackable, working with those quite expensive opti tracks, uh, whatever systems, it actually gives you, if you have it, a very easy way to. Yeah, but a, um, a load it. totally... It's a lot more expensive though. Right, yeah, honestly, and and a vibe tracker um, could do the same thing if you have the same yes. controlled environment, right? You have a uh, wherever my lighthouses are now, but um, yeah, that that would work. So it seems like you have a structure core sensor on top of yes, I do. Nice. And, yeah, let's and, take a look at it again. Um, yep. So uh, this is a sensor from Occipital, right? And here, so it's this part right here. I'm actually going yeah. This off, so. It almost looks like the Intel RealSense um, uh, sensor. Actually, that's what very much reminds yeah. me of, or Z Mini. Yep. But this is yep. a. It's a time. Is it a time of flight? Um, essentially, it looks that's like 3D, so, uh, right? No. So uh, it has uh, stereo IR cameras, oh, okay. and then has a very wide field of view fisheye camera here. The um, the actual depth sensor on here doesn't have that wide of field of view um and uh and i've shot some video of it uh sort of ironically through the leap motions camera so uh which is something that i'm, I'm i and they are uh, trying to 
deal with at the moment. So I, um, so I'm going to be upfront. Is there interference? With I'm going to be upfront about this. Yeah, there's some crosstalk. Mm. And so the demos that I've been doing right now, the hand tracking is a little more jittery than, uh, than without it. And, um, and so I'm not terribly happy about that. And uh, it sort of forces the, uh, the leap motion to switch modes uh, to try to correct for the fact that it sees an active IR light source uh, in its field of view. Uh, so you and not just that, thing. it's a pulsing one, right? So the hand tracking gets especially bad when your hand is within that the captured uh, cap the depth camera area. Well, so it's actually working. Use the different depth camera. So maybe one based more on the stereo that creates you a point cloud oh. out of the parallax. Right. Like I similar might. to the mixed I'm... reality. Yeah. Um, I'm well, not sure so... if motion can fix the interference, right? I mean, they both rely on uh, infrared, I would assume. So, OK. So first of all, I don't want you to judge the structure core based on, on this fact. No, right? no, no. Because, totally because, the firmware, reason, yeah. because the firmware is a work in progress, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it also may be possible to apply a filter film to uh, yeah. leap motion, uh, to the leap motion. When I, uh, when I first uh, told Occipital you know, about this crosstalk, right? They hadn't tested for it. And um, their response was, seriously, leap motion isn't filtering that, that uh, wavelength? Uh, so mm. they were surprised by it. Um, and they were really eager to see the structure core mounted on, on a North Star headset. Um, and were, were surprised when there ended up being that crosstalk. Um, so in, in terms of how the depth sensor on it works, um, I don't know if you've encountered the original structure sensor. So the original structure sensor was based on that same prime sense tech as the original Project Natal, you know, connect. Mm. Um, so it's, it's shooting an infrared uh, laser through a holographic diffraction grating that is producing a non-repeating uh, pattern, right? Mm -hmm. uh, onto the environment uh, in front of you or in front of it. And uh, then using an IR camera to interpret the deformation of mm -hmm. that pattern. Right. So, um, so the original structure core was based on, um, on PrimeSense technology. And Occipital ended up actually becoming the maintainers of the OpenNI uh, repo um, when, after Apple bought, uh, bought PrimeSense. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the sensing in this is, um, is no longer directly, you know, it doesn't have any components uh, in common with the PrimeSense tech. Um, but uh, is is still using that uh, you know infrared projection, laser projection through the diffraction grating, to uh, to produce that pattern, and and then what's one of the things that's different about this is that it has stereo IR cameras, so it's interpreting that pattern from two perspectives, and that does make a difference. Um, mm. And then uh, and then they're also doing optical slam. Using uh, using that uh, fisheye camera in there as well, and then they're fusing all of that data. So so it's a pretty so it's a pretty sophisticated sensor. They also have um, and those are synced up. Uh, the IR cameras are synced up global shutter uh, nice. IR cameras, and then um, uh, and then they've got an IMU in there as well, right? Okay, that's and quite a good deal, yeah. Um... Yeah. Uh, so no, I mean it sounds like there there might there might be multiple kind of solutions to positional tracking, and if you're going to be you know selling kits to developers, um, has this been the most optimum one for you, or, or would you recommend or like you know try to yeah recommend for developers to experiment with like let's say a Vive tracker or Opti track or or maybe even um, I don't know if you've experimented with it with like the Z Mini the uh, the just RGB. So I don't have a. But... I, I don't have a Z, Z Mini, but uh, I'm certainly interested in trying it. Um, it gets talked a lot, uh, talked about a lot on the uh, Discord uh, uh, server, right? Which is seems to be the sort of central 
the center point of the North Star community is, is the North Star Discord server. We'll have to, um, we'll have to link it as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, so, so there is lots of talk about the Z Mini. I'm the first person in there to get their hands on a structure core. Um, I really do like the tracking. Um, the fact that there is some interference between it and Leap Motion Sensor um, is obviously a problem. And um, there's, you know, looking for an alternative hand tracking solution, I don't consider an option because that would be incredibly bad form to take the reference design and cut their sensor out of it. Um, yeah, that's, and that's, that's what makes the North Star the North Star. Okay, it's sort of hard yeah. to overstate. Just like... and, and so um, so that's not even something I'll entertain. Um, uh, uh, just uh, and largely because it would set a bad precedent for, you know, uh, I obviously care a lot about open source hardware. It would set a bad precedent for other companies uh, considering uh, open sourcing their uh, their projects that have uh, real commercialization potential. So, Great. Mm -hmm. okay. So, um, I mean, we're kind of we're, we're I think crossing over an hour here. Um, ah. How so? How, I mean, what what are your overall thoughts when it comes to this headset? I think that's what I want to get get to at this um at the you know to wrap things up with this conversation is you're okay you're a developer you've used head, head mounted displays for a long time um and you're one of the only people now that i think is has been using kind of a higher fidelity version of augmented reality even if it's not vi both visually right field of view is wider but also the the ui and the interaction system itself is higher fidelity um you also have a views displayed you have other you know smart glasses um, kind of give us what your overall thoughts are about um, how you see this North Star, uh, how it fits into a developer's tool bag, um, and what you know what what are the benefits that come from that? Okay, so uh, in terms of class of headset, it's it's sort of in the same uh, class as the as the Meta Two uh, is was. I'm not okay. sure how to state that. Um, in that it is tethered. Right, um, the sensors and the Unity integration on on this, I actually think uh, are better. But uh, I never uh, actually owned um, a Meta Two, um, which is kind of funny because I designed the IMU board for the first iteration of the IMU board for the Meta One. Hmm. But um, the uh, um, so so this is in that it's a tethered headset needs to be connected to a PC, um, it's sort of in that same class. Um, that said, the vertical field of view makes a huge difference, mm. um, uh, as does the, uh, the low latency of that display path, right? and, uh, and the fact that it has, that it's built around the leap motion mm. and has, you know, hand tracking as its primary uh, interaction method rather than sort of added as an afterthought. Um, mm. I know in the case of the HoloLens, you know, that was its primary interaction method, mm, but yeah. it was so simplistic. I haven't um, found anyone who likes it, so. Yep. Dude, I and then defend them why they did that. Like, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's not a great interaction, but if you think of it uh, from their perspective as in, okay, we have Windows 8 or Windows 10 or whatever it was when they released, we need to make something that works with the input systems of Windows, nah. right now, which is a keyboard and a mouse, right? If your yeah. gaze can be the mouse, and we just need a click. And so the easiest thing we can do with hand tracking for a dev kit is that maybe I'm making excuses for them for, and, and I wouldn't be making these excuses for other companies, but I just think it's, I, uh, it's not a great place to be like in the future, but I think no, of course. given where we, where we were, it, it made sense to do just a, a click. To yeah. I just hope that with the new versions, it would have some kind of six degrees of freedom uh, controller because it would make so much sense. Um, but no, let me ask you a question. And uh, do you think that we are about to kind of discover and not invent um, what augmented reality will basically do with us and what we will do with it. Because so, so sometimes I have an impression, like let's say with Twitter, right? Someone who invented Twitter, I, or people who invented Twitter, they kind of built something that accidentally became quite huge. It wasn't like 
you couldn't never foresee how Twitter itself, and when you looked first, it would you know blow up so much. And the same goes kind of with you no know, smart assistants, right? With all those kind of Exas and uh, Google Voice assistants, right? They're all kind of really clumsy, yet people clock to them. 100 million of those Alex devices are basically sold, right? So people seem to want them, and I have them too. Yeah, you heard to you heard it today during the podcast, but they're still not perfect. And it seems like there is a lot of people like you are going a lot of efforts um, through a lot of efforts to build something that kind of fits our vision. And there are a lot of companies flocking around it and everyone has kind of their own vision. It seems like at some point we we will come closer to what it actually is for us, what it makes with us, what we want from it. Because clearly, like when you describe this interaction, when you have like you know your two hands and you shoot left and right, that resonates with me. And I think it resonates with a lot of people to have this ability to interact with the space. Is this is what drives you, and this is where you basically take out your motivation for building those things because you think that this is future. Or, well, I, I'm very curious to see what people are going to do with it. I've had my own fantasies about what you can do with AR for a very long time. Uh, I've been inspired by a lot of uh, fictional works. Um, uh, you guys mentioned um, uh, Lane, the anime yeah. uh, series, but um, even more relevant and maybe less well known is a series called Deno Coil. Um, mm -hmm. If you guys haven't seen it, make a point of checking it out. Uh, it's from a while ago, it's D-E-N-N-O, you, I think. So uh, Deno Coil really addressed the future potential of AR uh, quite well, quite a long time ago. There's also a book called Rainbow's End by Werner Vinge, uh, which used to be referenced a lot. Um, in fact, he was one of the keynote speakers uh, at one of the early uh, AWEs back, back when it was ARE. Um, and um, so, so these are both, uh, you know, pretty, you can get a lot of inspiration uh, out of those. Um, and for me, um, what I'm really ins inspired, uh, that the, the possibility that inspires me the most uh, these days, I'm, I'm less of a gamer nowadays, um, is uh, data interaction, data management. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, because I'm That's dealing cool, with that so much. a lot in, you know, in the manufacturing business, in product development and manufacturing, uh, there are a lot of complex processes. Um, also, uh, if I were running a business and I've pitched this idea to, to the CEO of, of NOAA Labs as well, you know, being able to see all of the moving parts, as it were, cash flow, contracts, and and all of that, Predictive visualized, yep, visualized spatially around you, rearrangeable, um, and and manipulable with with uh, gestures. Um, I think. Uh, would be much easier than at a computer with a keyboard and mouse for, for, you know, and VR, VR is already very good for that, um, sure. uh, for spatial data visualization. Um, although I haven't seen as much of it, uh, as I'd like to, um, and, uh, but also being able to use it, you know, even in the office, when it gets scaled down to a set of smart glasses, right? When, when something in the form factor of a Vuzix Blade or, or a North Vocals, right? Um, yeah. Has the same visual, dis stereoscopic visual display capability um, that, that North Star has. Um, Do you think and, it's and, and, and yeah. Magic Leap is already getting there, right? Um, yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I know. We, we all love to hate on them. And I, I yeah. made a big, I made a big point of it for a while, having not actually tried the headset based on other people's, um, you know, uh, based on the fact that they hadn't released the, the optics that we all sort of expected and, and so forth. And then at CES um, a month ago, um, I got to try one and got to play with Tonandi and everything. I was like, you know, this, uh, yeah, the field of view is narrow, it's, it's small. Um, but this is a pretty small package, and there's yeah, focal depth a, variability, and I, and nobody else has that yet. Um, there's also, you know, Enreal, 
is a mm-hmm. Chinese company that's um, making. A, ask, a... Uh, in terms of your opinion on on how China is actually, uh, how, first of all, culturally, like how do you think AR fits into like the Chinese culture, especially in like Shenzhen, like. Are, do, you, do people look at you if you're wearing any kind of you know smart glasses on the street especially things that look like they're smart glasses and perhaps also if you can also comment on like nreal and some of the ar headsets or ar headsets that were announced at ces in 2019. so i mean i think nreal is they're they're sort of the ones to be taking most seriously mm-hmm. and um i i got to try out uh so, so the current ones are just sort of micro display based um, uh, pass through optics, uh, a lot like um, uh, uh, Osterhout Group uh, was using, and, and uh, yeah, yeah, and uh, and so forth. Um, but uh, the um, you know, but so so it still isn't variable depth. That said. Um, at AWE in a in a closed off conference room, you know, in one of the uh, demo suites, uh, I got to check out a, um, a basically a modulated light field display uh, that they had there. Now it was bolted down, and uh, they were you know showing a little virtual creature jumping from the top of one soda can to another, and you know, uh, but the depth. Um, the depth variability was very good. So they aren't, uh, you know, they have stuff in the works and and are worth taking seriously. Yeah. The, the reason why I wasn't impressed by the variable focal display of Magic Leap is because I had a year and a half before that I had tried the Avagant uh, mixed reality light field display that they kind of ah. wanted to license. Or I think they're still working on that, on, on licensing to other OEMs. But that had real continuous focal so like whatever you know i had something way up close to my to my nose to something across the room and i could actually switch focus and i had correct blur and bokeh and it had you know it didn't need eye tracking to do that it was real continual eye focus so if we're so i haven't tried that it's a well, very I, I don't think many many people have um but th- seeing that and then seeing oh you have two very discrete focal planes with waveguides and just just yeah. just a second throw a second you know throw a second waveguide in there and call it um a light field very oh man we went into this on a very deep on a podcast mm. in terms of like uh just looking into the terminology that magic leap was using to describe oh my god the photo- photonic light field chips uh-huh. what <laughs> what the you know, I'm. I, I don't know what your cursing policy is on this podcast, so I'm not going to do it. But but that's a real WTF. Um, I was just yeah. like, call, call it by what it is, and and actually, that's what bothered me most about them is yeah, same with they're, us, they're telling this story about how they're inventing spatial computing. I'm uh-huh. like, they've been using the term spatial computing in academic papers for decades now. Augmented reality is a well-established field academically. Yeah. You know, ISMAR, the ISMAR conferences, you know, the yes. IEEE International IEEE Symposium EBR, on Mixed IEEE and IEEE Augmented stuff, yeah. Reality has been around for a long time. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that people like, uh, you know, Stephen Feiner at, um, uh, at uh, Columbia, right, has been working on this stuff for a very long time doing you know inter interaction studies and coming up with best practices um you know for uh you know and he was um funded by by microsoft long long before the hololens came out and um uh so you know magic leap is like we're 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 exploring best practices for spatial computing interactions yeah. it's a completely new thing that's never been done i'm like no it has there is a huge body of research yeah. and and there are academics who have been working on this for I mean, a they very, mostly very work long at time. because they hired actually a lot of uh, academics um they yeah. i mean to, to be honest what's so magic about magic leap is the fact that they managed to pull it off right I mean, you look at the project North Star and you see what's today basically doable with the demand that is there, uh, like, you know, a few uh, nerds and, you know, a few enthusiasts. And same kind of was with the DK1. I mean, the DK1 was kind of, you know, it was definitely not for everyone and 
It was just, you know, to get it into the hands of people who kind of understand the future. With the Magic Libre, they kind of jumped in front of the train, and now there is kind of a very crazily industrially properly designed device. I mean, I hold it in my hands. The way it's built, like even when you look at I fix the steer down, it's crazy. It's, it's amazing. A master, it's a masterpiece it's almost, of engineering. It's almost too beautiful for a development kit, which is what exactly was was saying. That, that if it, if it looked worse, people would would judge it yeah. more harshly. You know. <laughs> yeah, but the question is, it, why do they have it? Why did they it build doesn't it deliver right now? The experience. Yeah, it's also too expensive for developers. It's kind of doesn't fulfill its purpose. So the question is, why did they have it in the first place? Because there is no particular reason right now. Unfortunately, even though it would be amazing if we would be ready for it no, I'm, I'm... and i keep go, go for it well i was gonna say i i actually use this a lot i see the north star as potentially being the dk1 of ar right um in yeah. in that it's inexpensive the dk1 was incredibly cheap uh for for what it was at the time there was yes. nothing like it for that price point um or really at all but um and uh you know, and it was accessible. Developers could impulse purchase this, right? Mm -hmm. I so while I was one of the first, you know, backers of of the DK One, I actually hadn't heard about the project ahead of time. A friend of mine, uh, Chris Grayson, actually called me up and said, "By the way, the you know the the um, Oculus um, the Oculus Rift campaign is live. They're taking orders now." I'm like, what the hell is that? And he's like. It's a VR headset. It's going to change everything. You got. I was like, okay, cool, three hundred bucks. Yeah, order. Boom. <laughs> Total impulse buy, and and you can't do that with the Magic Leap one. It no. has to be a considered purchase. And and with the North Star, it, it sort of still needs to be a considered purchase if you don't own a three D printer. But yeah, if you do, yeah. it's just a no-brainer. It's like the coolest 3D printed project you can make. If you have a decent computer and um, and a 3D printer, you buy the parts from me, hopefully, and um, and uh, you know, and you're up and running. Not like there are any other people offering parts, right? I mean, I don't think I, anyone has I, a choice. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, at the moment, at the moment, um, yeah. you know, that might might not last. But uh, at the moment, I'm the only one producing the lenses. Look out for the shipment the for that's it. going into the headquarter of Magic Leap. I guarantee you they will order one, right? Um, I <laughs> uh, um, obviously can't divulge the, identity, the identities of companies that have ordered this uh, from us so far. Okay. Um, uh, but because they're they're placed through a store page, right? It's mm -hmm. not like they called me up and asked for it. Uh, there's um, so Noah Labs has a, a sort of a retail offshoot subsidiary, and so mm -hmm. I'm having them do the fulfillment. Um, oh. Obviously, there's a privacy policy in place, oh, um, awesome. but but there there are a lot there are there are a lot of names you know uh, hmm. purchasing the parts okay. for this. I, I can imagine, and I'm sure. I'm hoping to see more of these on my Twitter feed. So, uh, to our listeners, if you're interested, um, and we'll like to there mess around with hardware, and that this would be cool to to work with. Um, so, we promised earlier in the episode to talk about the Hololens two and to kind of give our uh, quick thoughts or perhaps rumor speculations before the announcement, which is uh, in a few weeks. So um, just, I'm just going to read this off of Tom's guide in terms of what rumors. What, there's been very little rumors, surprisingly, about the HoloLens 2. Microsoft has kept it very well locked down. Uh, but supposedly it's going to have a wilder, wider field of view. I think that's probably going to be on top of the yeah. list. Um, this one says from 35 degrees to 70 degrees. That's a 2x <laughs> increase. A Qualcomm Snapdragon inside. Um, mm -hmm. with, I think even, uh, they're saying that perhaps an LTE connection. That... Yeah. They'll probably jump to the new, uh, Snapdragon that they release is basically for VR. Yeah. Uh, okay. So it's, uh, so it's not the XR one. It's not the XR oh? one. It's the 855. Okay. I think this is confirmed. Okay. That's, that's great. To know. Uh, it's oh. really beefy. It's actually a desktop yeah. uh, chip, right? It's designed for uh, laptop, uh, the what the Snapdragon. Uh, I think the 855. 855 is actually for, or maybe I'm mixing up with it. I think it's still but it's mobile, beefy. but it's yeah, 
it's incredibly powerful. But AR requires a lot of horsepower. I mean, it's no. analyzing a lot of things very, and, but, more so but, than but VR. The, but the analyzing happens, as far as I understand, at least on the whole, there's one more on the FPGA side. So I know that um, the sensors that the Microsoft HoloLens One uses produce like one terabyte of data per second, and it's being jumped into a custom SOX or system on a chip, which then basically derives a lot. Because, I mean, they were stuck using an Atom. There is no way an Atom can process a terabyte of data, you know? Yeah. Well, so, I mean, with the, I think starting with the Snapdragon 835, um, the, uh, you know, uh, Qualcomm introduced uh, circuitry that, that's specifically for, so, so it may be, you know, an ASIC essentially embedded in, in the SOC yeah. um, that... Uh, like a reprogrammable uh, part of the processor. For, yeah, for, for doing the VIO, for, for the visual inertial uh, odometry. Uh, so, you know, you don't need a, a secondary specialized ASIC or FD, Also, FD, um, the HoloLens yeah. 2 is going to have the new uh, Kinect sensor. And I think the Kinect sensor has some kind of uh, calculation unit on top of it. Right? They shown it previously, like a year or two ago, I think. Yeah, this is something that Microsoft Research showed. Um, their kind of new time of flight uh connect kind of sensor uh yeah. looked really clean and had much wider yes. range um because by the way for for our listeners like we had the depth kit um one of the co-founders on and the connect yeah, 2 is still kind of one of the best uh yep. depth cameras that you can get for to do like volumetric video with like the intel real sense is great for um other applications but less so when it comes to like clean human video feed um with depth so uh yeah there's maybe there's there's a lot there and and, and i know microsoft has had a lot of improvements on it but they just have not had a reason to release anything do you think it will have a controller a controller maybe maybe i mean it's really hard to say i think the really the biggest thing of this headset is going to be the display is going to be um, on a, just a, like a new generation uh, optics as well as the the hardware that it's running on are just going to be like uh, it's kind of like the quest of AR like you know or uh, um, do you really do you think it will be the quest of AR because so far Microsoft managed That's through their bad. sheer power yeah. I mean it could be but you see there are like a lot of those B two B projects right now. You see, like a lot of big brands, you know, bragging how they use HoloLens in their everyday, you know, mm -hmm. teaching people how to pick. Picking is a term from logistics, where they pick together yeah, boxes. Yeah. yeah, sure. You take a three thousand euro device, put it on someone that only runs two hours, that earns less than eight euro per hour that he's going to pick. You know, that's probably not going to happen. The question that I always have in my mind is: Was it, you know, HoloLens two? Will it be this device that will be actually usable? Finally, it's good because... enough for the army. It's good enough for the yeah, United States. For the States army, you can take. I mean, but the army is probably um, one of those instances where you're ready to take any difficulties. I mean, look at how people operate missiles or whatever. Like a shitload of buttons, right? So, in, yeah, in a yeah. sense, I, I think, think I think it's the opposite. Like the army would probably has higher. Um, in, in things need to work more and more consistently with users that know less about this technology. Like it's it's like probably even a harder use case to try to like design for. Um, but I think the, the big advantage that Hull, that Microsoft does have over Magic Leap is their enterprise focus yeah. because like their headset doesn't have constricted field of view, doesn't have you know uh, things that like OSHA would have problems with when it comes to safety regulations. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean this is going to be really really interesting for especially for enter enterprise um, wanting to have an actual AR you know headset to to build something for so um cool okay i think i think we're we've gone through one one last thing i asked you that that uh i think i, I asked you two questions and you forgot the first one was have you worn kind of like smart glasses or AR, ar glasses around Shenzhen and um culturally like is that significant in china like the do people do you think like china is re more ready for ar than than america is in some ways i think it is and so i so I showed up in Shenzhen wearing Google Glass daily, and it was at the height of backlash against Glass right. in the States. And nobody had anything negative 
uh, to say about it. Um, everyone just thought it was really cool. Oh, what is that? Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, so I I think they are more ready for it. Cool. And um, you know, weird weird looking things are are kind of okay here. Yeah, no, that's that's very interesting. America really in the West is like. I think has a uh, has a wounded leg when it for AR because everything is going to be compared to glass, so it's just it's it's a hard uh, barrier to go over. So that's why people are trying to like completely circumvent it and go around so, and never even talk about you know AR or smart glasses. So, so from yeah, from a business perspective though, there's actually a little bit of resistance uh, to to AR at the moment because maybe a year ago or a year and a half ago, when things weren't quite ready, uh, or, or maybe even two, might even be longer than that, mm -hmm. there was a big wave of um, AR yeah. investment. Sorry, can you scream, what's Joseph? So there was a... Peter there. Um, yeah. So there was a big wave of AR investment, and uh, most of those startups, there was no actual substance to them and and a lot of them failed so um investment here tends to follow trends mm -hmm. whereas whereas in the west right you're looking for something unique that other people haven't invested in yet and it's like this you know this hasn't been done whereas here people and and i think this is totally backwards want something that's proven mm -hmm. oh smart watches are catching on Smartwatches are a good investment. I'm going to find a smartwatch company to invest in. Whereas, of course, the you know if if the market already knows about it, and this is my opinion, or actually my dad used to tell me this: if the market already knows about it, it isn't good investment intelligence. Yeah, um, because people, it's already a thing that you're not capitalizing by being an early person i think it's that that's like a fundamental difference between american companies and chinese companies is american companies are vision driven and chinese companies are like f first and foremost profit driven in the beginning um and if yeah in that you'll see uh what you're you know hitching your your wagon to being different so if you're profit driven then you're most likely gonna try to build something that is that already has a, a trend or like something provable that can create um, like generate money now, even in the earliest stage of the company versus in America. It's yeah. like, oh, you know, we can be visionaries and predict that in 10 years, um, this technology will have matured enough to ha be a profitable market yeah. and have investors, you know, support you until then. But um, yeah. yeah, there's investors apply of both. Yeah. And, and investors apply a lot of pressure pretty quickly here. Uh, they want to see returns right. uh, pretty quickly. At least uh, that's the prevalent culture right now. It's really hard to generalize about China, though, right. and Shenzhen especially, hmm. because it, things change. Things evolve here so quickly. I mean, and, and you know, in this city in particular, it's the fastest growing city in the world. And, and um, that's a good point. You know, so from one year to the next, it's hard to recognize. I mean, the city exists only since a few years, right? Uh, 30, uh, yeah, 30 some odd years. And it's it's gone from uh, a few hundred thousand people to, uh, I, I, it's been a long time since there's been a census done, but it's estimated anywhere between 15 and 25 million people. Yeah, just, um, just nothing, yeah. Just, just a little bit of people. Yeah, the fastest growing, fastest growing city in the history of mankind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pretty awesome. Okay, now, um, how can people find you? Excuse me. How can people find you, reach you, um, and or can perhaps contact you about uh, these projects? Okay, so uh, at the moment, probably the best place to see what I'm doing is uh, unfortunately uh, on Twitter. So it's um, my Twitter handle is n o a z a r k. No is r. No h. Ah. Uh, in there, so N O A Z A R K, um, and uh, uh, let's see. I don't have an up-to-date website about the uh, project. I, uh, I have integratedrealities.com from way back when, but uh, sure, uh, but I might start posting about it 
there eventually. But for the time being, Twitter's the best place to find something. All right. And uh, you... Um, yeah. Sorry. Go for it. The best place for ordering the parts is uh, smartprototyping.com hyphenated. So smart-prototyping.com. That's where you can buy the parts, the uh, lenses, uh, the displays, the driver board. And uh, I should have mentioned that much earlier in the podcast. Yeah, we'll um, worry. Link link for these and, um, and know if you Your can also help us find the link for the Discord group for the uh, for this yeah, absolutely. community as well. Would be I awesome. have it. Oh, you got it already. Cool. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you can find the Research VR podcast on Twitter at Research VR Cast. Uh, we like to post uh, videos, uh, clips, and 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 all the good stuff that uh, of of our weekly episodes. Um, and we also like to retweet our previous guests. So anytime there's like developments that they've been doing, um, interesting things that uh, we know you guys would like. It's always populated there. That's kind of, Twitter is our really ma our most active um, place that you can see you know can do some of what's new. And we do have a very active Discord channel as well. Uh, we're nearing two hundred members now. Um, wow! Yeah, I know that one. That one grew a lot quicker than to a hundred. Um, and that's also where we have post episode discussions. We have that's also where you can suggest guests uh, to come on the podcast and topics. Um, as well as just random link sharing that we do. Um, I also, there is a shameless plug channel. So uh, if you are a developer on that's listening to this and you have, and you're working on something cool, something that um, you, you think, you know, Peter and I would like to see, or even the other listeners, the other VR, AR, you know, pioneers uh, would like to see and perhaps even collaborate on. That is what, that is why it's there. Um, go and throw your work in. We're, we're happy to take a look at it and see it. Um, I guess it's not maybe worth talking about it on the podcast, but we are doing a Patreon only stream. At least I am a, a short one this Sunday, uh, which is going to be outdated by the time you hear this, because by the time you hear this, I will have moved and a lot of have, uh, changes will have happened in my life. Um, all of which I'll be happy to talk more about. Um, but yeah, in the Patreon stream, I'm going to do like an AMA and talk a lot more about a photogrammetry um what i did in china what i did in the desert in nevada uh mm -hmm. and what i'm going to be doing for the rest of 2019 so uh <laughs> drones and photogrammetry man that, those are my those that's my bread and butter <laughs> nice <laughs> awesome. cool yeah i'm excited so uh, if you don't support us yet on uh you know uh on patreon and you don't want to support us on patreon you could still spread around the news that we exist Rate us, give us, uh, you know, reviews, share it with your friends, force people to listen to it, basically print out our audio and just throw it out of the window so everyone can get a piece of that audio. Like ticker tape on New Year's yeah. Day on uh, Times Square, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, no, if you like listening to this podcast um, and you want to help to keep the virtual lights on the in the, in the virtual room, um, find us on Patreon. Uh, we are hashing out kind of the tiers and rewards but even it's sorry it's as little as two dollars i think would be if if you find more than two dollars worth of value in this podcast every month uh consider <laughs> you know buying us half a cup of coffee that would really really be nice according to san francisco prices yes i don't know i don't know if in shenzhen can you get cheaper better coffee for t uh for two dollars noah I think actually uh, Starbucks is more expensive here and, uh, you know, yeah. good coffee is, is pretty pricey here because it isn't ubiquitous. You know, it isn't really a Chinese thing. Right. Exactly. It's a very much less, uh, they, they're much more of a tea culture. I had some awesome tea ceremonies in China. Um, yes. I learned a lot. I also, I really want to go back to the point that you just made in terms of like not overgeneralizing about China because I've, I've, I really was like facing my own, um, I guess like I had my idea of how people in uh, companies in China, tech in China function and what they cared about. And, and I was somewhat surprised as well. So that could be an entire other podcast uh, for another day. So thank you again, Noah, for joining us. And, uh, and hopefully we'll see you. Uh, we'll see more of your work in the future. Thank you. Goodbye, uh, everyone. Awesome, Peter. Really appreciate it. Thank you all for listening, and we'll see you next time. Goodbye.